start because Dr. Jain doesn't like to give introductions and I'll follow you up there. Um, good evening and a very warm welcome. Before we begin, may I please request all of you to put your phone on silent? Yeah? Um, this evening we have the eminent art and cultural historian, Dr. Chakundra Jain, presenting The Goddess and the Buffalo, Art, Mythology and Ritual of Goddess Worship in India. Dr. Jain? Sorry. Dr. Jain is currently the director and managing trustee of CIVIC, the Center for Indian Visual Culture in Delhi. He is based out of New Delhi and has previously been the director of the Crafts Museum, professor and dean of the School of Arts and Aesthetics, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and member secretary of the IGNC. His seminal uh, publications include other masters, five contemporary folk and tribal artists of India, and India popular culture, the conquest of the world as a picture. In today's lecture, Dr. Jain aims to present an analysis of the goddess myth as it appears in texts and visual sources. He will discuss one of the most intriguing iconographic motives in Indian art, that of the goddess killing the buffalo and the goddess Kali or Durga trampling upon the body of the consort Shiva. Uh, may I request you to keep your questions to the end? Yeah, we will have a uh, 20 minute QA and further discussions can be had over more coffee in this case. Dr. Jen, more than you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The first slide? Yes. Good evening. You don't know how pleased I am to see, uh, I mean any, any person speaking to an audience would be if the hall is overflowing. So nice to see you here and thanks for coming in such a large number. Uh, uh, sometimes when I see that many people I wonder whether I'll fulfill your, uh, your, uh, uh, you know the, the reason you come here and I hope you feel that what I do is somewhat worthwhile and something different than you already know. Now the, the whole issue of the goddess and the buffalo is extremely uh, complex, very little explored uh, and because like all other things we have been accepting whatever was in Hindu scriptures and uh, that became in the colonial period the truth for most aspects of Indian culture. So we never felt the need to explore. Uh, if you look at a lot of material that is scattered all over India with regard to the goddess and the buffalo, and you compare it with the inherited single Hindu myth of the goddess and the buffalo, you would uh, you'll realize that the Hindu myth is sort of constructed out of very complexly widespread material about the goddess and the buffalo. What is this thing about the goddess and the buffalo? What kind of relationship the goddess has with the buffalo? We all know uh, from, from the Hindu text that the standard thing, that there was a, there was a fight between the, the god asuras and devas, the gods and the demons, and that uh, that the gods created a goddess putting all their promise and power into a female and that she was created to kill many demons and Mahesha Sura, Mahesha Sura, Mahesha Asura, meaning the buffalo demon, was one of the, those who the goddess killed. We accepted it, we worshipped all over India. A time came, quite early actually, already uh, in the 70s, that some of the scholars began to question the whole, whole motive of the goddess killing the buffalo and wanting to know what is the raw material from which the Sanskrit text might have been constituted or constructed. So this material was never looked up, uh, never explored because our faith was in scriptures. And that's what I think is happening even today, both uh, politically, socially, that, uh, that uh, when, the, the, when the, 
like the whole beef issue which is now coming up, when certain scriptures are questioned and a lot of material which is lying there, when it is, we start to explore there, the anthropology and archaeology of that material, we, we find that the relationship between the goddess and the buffalo was very different. The first important scholar to do work in detail was, he was uh, uh, David Schulman. He was professor in Chicago University, but also he was a professor in uh, Israel. And he wrote a masterpiece of a book in 1970s somewhere, uh, which is called Tamil Temple Myths. Tamil Temple Myths. But before that, in a journal of the Chicago University, he published a paper called Murderous Bride, the motif of the goddess killing the buffalo. Murderous Bride. So what is that murderous bride issue uh, here? Uh, all over India, there are large number of myths which are spread in different departments among tribals, among, among local Hindu communities. And then there is a lot of visual material that is available. When we put it together, uh, I think we, we find that, uh, that uh, things were very different. Another scholar to do uh, wonderful work in this area was Günther Dietz Sontheimer in Germany. And he, uh, and uh, Sontheimer, uh, did a lot of work in Maharashtra, and he was inspired by earlier work by a very brilliant Maharashtrian, born Maharashtrian scholar, D. D. Kosambi. Kosambi was also doing field work in different parts and collecting uh, material, different local stories of the goddess killing the buffalo. And then, uh, taking a clue from these people, I, because Kosambi said that the kind of relationship that he found between the goddess and the buffalo, the erotic relationship between the goddess and the buffalo, he said uh, these stories must be spread in other parts of India. Taking a clue, in 1960s and 70s, I did a lot of field work in Rajasthan and Gujarat, and I also found very similar material. That means all over India, there is this motif prevalent, and there is a, a, a kind of uh, complex, very complex relationship that we will see now. Now both the iconographies that you can see here are quite uh, interesting. The standard classical Sanskrit scripture based iconography which you find in temple and uh, you see here uh, the young goddess riding a lion and uh, in Indian psychology lion and tiger are always mixed up. So and often pronounced as lo uh, also pronounced as loin in North India. So, so, so the uh, goddess, you know, is uh, in a battle, and Mahishasura, the demon, is shown here. He was a very renowned Shiv Bhakt, and many sculptures he's shown wearing Shiva's linga uh, as a kind of uh, uh, neck ornament. Standard Hindu iconography that the goddess would uh, destroy Mahishasura. There's another iconography which nobody has been able to explain. And when you can't explain, call it Tantri. So you don't have to explain. <laughs> so so uh, there is this iconography of the goddess trampling upon the body of Shiva, her consort. How do we explain this iconography? Sanskrit texts are not able to explain that. But when you look at, uh, look at material scattered here and there and put these parts together, another story emerges. So we are going to talk about these two, uh, uh, two iconographies and others also. Now today I will be dealing with one of the most intriguing and, uh, intriguing and widespread iconographic motives in Indian art, that is that of the goddess killing the buffalo and that of the goddess Akali or Durga trampling upon the body of her consort Shiva. Intriguingly, the motifs are found represented in scriptural Hindu sculpture uh, and painting by thousands. But in the living uh, Brahmanic ritual practices, these are uh, nearly absent uh, but are still found <coughs> relevant in the vernacular practices. So uh, the, the killing of the buffalo demon, 
drinking of the blood is mentioned in the scripture also, but this, these practices over centuries for ideological reason, reconstituting Hinduism in an idealized uh, uh, religion over the centuries, that uh, this practices, these practices have disappeared. The first scholar who drew attention to Liva Devi Kosambi, as I already told you. Uh, now, I would show you a few examples of sculptural, uh, uh, classical sculptural things, and then we'll go to the stories and the folk rituals and uh, folk legends. Now, uh, the entire historiography of the study of living Indian myths and rituals stands witness to the biased belief that the scriptural Hindu myths were the archetypal and that vernacular ones were the degenerate rendering of the former. So for years and years, entire Indological development in the British period, when, when Sanskrit texts were translated into German and English, we were told that or the uh, uh, Hindu upper classes, Brahmins and others, always believed that Hindu scriptures were the fountainhead of all the mythology uh, that is in the country, and then they got vernacularized, they got corrupted, and then uh, people were just uh, rendering versions of these, which is which is not true, as we will see. So, uh, so, and this has a political dimension that this would lead to the idea of Hindu origin of this country, and then would lead to the idea of uh, or the theory of Hindu nation, in the sense that we already know that certain political uh, ideologues would say that Indus Valley civilization was Aryan, that Aryans did not come from outside India, but they were, uh, they were uh, original inhabitants of this country, so that when you go towards the origin, you define that origin to be Hindu and ignore the multiple cultural, of, uh, cultural uh, forms that existed in this country. So this is another dimension that comes out of one motif, but you take any motif and this kind of thing happen. Now, arrival of the Aryans and the autochthony question, who were the original inhabitant also, one can touch upon through this, but I'm not going into that just now. The entire historiography of the study of living Indian myths and ritual stands witness to the, the biased belief that the scriptural Hindu myths were archetypal and that the vernacular ones were the degenerate rendering of the former. Uh, <clears throat> then there is the opposite process also, that is certain local myths and legends got imbibed into Hinduism. Take, there are many examples. Go through the entire Vedic literature go through all the four Vedas, all the Brahmana texts, Upanishads, uh, Aranyakas, they, they compose the main bulk of Vedic texts. Now Vedic literature, the Brahmanic literature, has no goddesses except Usha, the rising sun, or some of the spirits of nature. There are no goddesses. Aryans were quite patriarchal people, so there were no goddesses. Krishna did not exist in the entire Vedic literature, except in one Upanishad, which could be a later edition when it says Krishna Devaki Putra. But the entire story of Mahabharata, Ramayana, it's a Ram didn't exist, Sita doesn't exist. Sita exists in Veda only as the goddess of the pharaohs. So there's another etymological question rather than Sita as Rama's wife. That means when the Aryans, whether they came from outside or whether they were living in the northeastern India, as they spread in, in the country, they came across other cultures, other stories, other mythologies, and a lot of these got imbibed in Hinduism and imbibed in the political world in the sense that you, you, you appropriate. So when we say imbibe, we sound neutral, but when we say appropriate, we become political. So a lot of these were appropriated. How? I'll give an example. You've seen uh, the it was large terracotta horses from Tamil Nadu, which uh, many people have in their gardens, and uh, you know these are offered as shrines. I think. Now these are horses dedicated to a deity called Ayanar. Now, but Ayanar, uh, it is said, that was born of a union between 
uh, Shiva and Vishnu as Mohini. So Vishnu had taken the form of Mohini and uh, uh, from the union of these, uh, Ayanar was born. So what's happening here? Opposite process, that is the people are uh, trying to Hinduize because it's a kind of upward social mobility question. So uh, there's an, in Bengal, there might be a few people from Bengal here, uh, there's this uh, story of the goddess Manasa related to snakes. Now it is said that Manasa was born uh, and she was the great rival of Shiva. And Shiva, when once he saw Mohini, uh, he ejaculated in public. And a crow came and picked the semen and took it somewhere and then the goddess Manasa was born. So in a way she is Shiva's daughter. But Manasa, who is a local goddess related to snake, uh, snake worship and snake bite, becomes slowly Hinduized because of a larger presence and powerful presence of another community. So both processes uh, exist. There are hundreds of such examples. Examples of such uh, composite cultural uh, location are many, but in this lecture I shall confine to uh, the goddess in the popular uh, motif. Now, <clears throat> uh, let me first summarize the Hindu myth of the goddess killing Mahishasura and other demons and then, uh, and then uh, comparatively look at other non-Sanskritic local myths of the goddess and the buffalo. The most formidable Sanskrit story is in the Devi Mahatmya, which is a part of the Markandeya Purana, meaning medieval, uh, medieval, so late as that. Uh, Markandeya Purana, which starts with the first part of the goddess, which starts with the first uh, part, the goddess kills Madhu and Kaitava. In the second part, Mahisha, in the uh, Mahisha, in the third part, Rakta Bija, Chandamunda, and Sumbanishumba. So whole Devi Mahatmya refers to killing of this uh, demon. And uh, uh, then there is a quote, while killing Mahisha, she jumped and uh, then landed herself on the great Asura and pressing her foot, uh, as you can see here somewhere, uh, pressing her foot uh, on his throat, struck him with a spear. Thereupon, trampled upon uh, 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 under her foot, the Asura half issued, uh, uh, half issued, uh, half issued from uh, his buffalo mouth in his real human form. The goddess cut off his head and with great, uh, with her great sword. Very interesting. Had a lot of Pahari paintings and miniature painting. Often demons are sort of taken from Mughal painting. And this morning I was mentioning and showed some example that often in later Indian painting, uh, demons were shown as a kind of Muslims. Now you see, these are the readings of, of uh, readings that we have to look at uh, or read them like picture reading in a manner that, uh, that such messages do come out of, of painting. Now, uh, <clears throat> now, this is uh, uh, on top, there is a, a miniature painting and uh, important for folk rituals. Devi Mahatmya further says, meaning the Sanskrit text, but from his stricken body, the blood flowed profusely. Chamunda licked it. Now, what would the Pandit said, Chamunda licked it with her mouth, and the Matrikas, with the mother goddesses, born from the bodies of the gods, danced, being intoxicated with blood. That is chapter 3 and stanza 62 uh, talks about in Devi Mahatmya about this. There's also this uh, very famous reference of uh, the goddess sucking the blood of the buffalo after decapitating and taking out the artery and sucking directly from this. So the sentence there is Devi Mukhena with mouth. Devi Mukhena Jagrahe. Jagrahe sat. Rakta Bijasya Shonitam. Rakta Bija is the demon and Shonita is blood. So Devi sat the blood of the demon Rakta Bija from her mouth. This is Sanskrit. 
But as I said right in the beginning, uh, this has disappeared over time for ideological reasons from Hindu ritualism. But all over India, in, at local level, at folk level, these rituals survive. And I will show you later on some of the examples from my earlier field work. In Devi Mahatmya, the various demons en uh, enchanted by the goddess make proposals of marriage with her. This we know, and she refuses. In scores of lesser known local legends of the motives, the goddess is shown as enchanted by the prowess of Mahisha, because he was also a powerful demon. He was attractive, he was Shiva Bhakta, and he had extraordinary prowess and power. So the goddess in local myths, she is enchanted by him, and it was difficult for the goddess to kill Mahisha. All throughout, if you read, it was not easy. And is described as bridegroom whom she finally kills. In Maharashtra, the deity Masoba, uh, in, in Dhangar, Dhangarwad, in those areas, you find uh, Maharashtra, the deity Masoba appears in some stories as the victim of the goddess, while in others, her consort Shiva himself. Uh, so, uh, Shiva himself becomes the victim of the goddess. Now, uh, I come to uh, some examples from folk rituals and how they contrast uh, uh, from the Sanskritic ones. Some examples to show how the local goddesses are not derived from the Hindu myths. They are their own legends of origin. In Western India, the goddess killing the buffalo is Vihat. She is not called Durga or Kali or, uh, you know, she is called Vihat. Vihat is a kind of uh, form which its Sanskritic origin would be Vishat, meaning 20 armed goddess. So, Vihat. Asapari, Khodiya, the goddess standing on crocodile is Khodiya, not Ganga, because in Hindu iconography, crocodile, uh, the goddess standing is Ganga. Uh, most local goddesses create a creature from their body dirt, but are not Parvati's creating Ganesha. So when, for example, uh, Shiva was in trouble, and I'll tell you the story later, then Par uh, uh, so uh, he needed help. And then he just rubbed his hands like that and took out some dirt and blew life into it and then created a creature whom uh, he gave his damru and then he went to wake up the goddess. So uh, this, uh, and then she, uh, goddess comes and helps uh, him. Uh, Parvati is creating Ganesha, buffalo riding goddess, we heard goat riding melody, cock riding, bahuchara take their own vehicles as sacrifice, which doesn't happen in Hinduism, like the goddess's vehicle is lion or tiger, but the goddess doesn't take the sacrifice of her vehicle. But in, in, in folk level, at folk, and therefore you can see here that the goddess is riding a buffalo and we have, and the, the uh, priests of that goddess are bringing buffaloes to her uh, for sac uh, sacrificing to her. So again, we can't say that all this comes from Sanskrit uh, uh, Sanskrit version. Similarly here, there is a goddess here called Melody. Melody is seated on a goat, but uh, the, the priests are bringing goats to sacrifice to her. Similarly, there is a goddess here called Bahuchara, who is the goddess of eunuchs. All, from all over India, eunuchs come to Gujarat and uh, once a year uh, in a place called Bahuchara. And this goddess is known as Bahuchara. To her, uh, roosters are offered as sacrifice. However, under the influence of Vaishnavas and Jainas, a twist is given to the myth of these goddesses to turn them into vegetarian. Uh, so, you know, this is like uh, quite a lot going on, it must have gone on for centuries in India that, uh, that Hinduism uh, was being constantly constructed, reconstructed based on ideologies and things. This process is found all over India. And there's also a thing of Bhagatization, that is people go, Hindus go, even before the rise of RSS, etc., there has been a long, long process of people going uh, to places, tribal areas, and Bhagatize them. So they have to take vow that they will not drink alcohol, they will not uh, uh, have uh, 
blood sacrifice, so they will not eat meat, etc. This process is an old process in India. Myth is not one author story, it evolves uh, and has versions. Now, in some stories from uh, Maharashtra, Masoba, meaning the buffalo, appears as the goddess's victim and in other stories as, as her consort. So slowly we are going, moving towards uh, Yeah, here I forgot to explain to you this image. Uh, I only talked about goddesses, bloodthirsty goddesses uh, running towards the demon. And here, in one of the local stories in Gujarat, the buffalo, uh, the goddess is in love with a buffalo, and then uh, she, so he comes decked up as bridegroom, and she is receiving him as bride by putting a forehead mark on him. So this is very different from uh, the story. The question is, what constitutes the raw material for the Puranic story of Maisha Surumadini? Where does the Puranic story, Puranic meaning Sanskritic story come? In some stories from Maharashtra, Masoba appears as the goddess's victim and others as her consort. The male god in many South Indian villages is still often a buffalo king, Potu Raju in Telugu and some Tamil areas. Even today the word is used, Potu. Uh, for buffalo. Sometimes uh, he is the husband of the goddess, uh, is husband of the goddess. In the sacrificial rituals, a buffalo is married to the goddess and after the sacrifice, the wedding ceremony is repeated with a new buffalo. It's very interesting. Goddess and after the sacrifice, the wedding ceremony is repeated with a new buffalo, lest she be left a widow. So she's taken the sacrifice but then she shouldn't become a widow. So, you know, this is something not parallel to Sanskrit and therefore Sanskrit story doesn't come. But all over India is not one example uh, in Tamil Nadu or Andhra or Mahara. This All over India, this, uh, as I already told you, this Tamil temple myths and things, so many versions are create, uh, collected and analyzed. So, the sacrifice of the goddess's consort is explained by a myth as recorded by Henry Whitehead in 1921, much before RSS, much before anything, the process of this Hinduization uh, and upward social mobility using Hindu model is old uh, in this country. Um, um, so Whitehead wrote a book called Village Gods of South India and published it in 1921. According to it, an outcast man fraudulently marries a Brahmin girl who was saying that he didn't say that he was outcast, fraudulently marries a Brahmin girl who, on realizing the truth, commits suicide and is uh, reborn to tell the villagers to behead her husband. In the next birth, the husband is reborn as a buffalo who is sacrificed to the village goddess. So, uh, you see, again, an example to show that. The myth of the goddess and the buffalo is complex, widespread, and there are many, many versions. According to uh, uh, to a myth of uh, of the bees, I think not of, of the bees uh, and Veenas of South Rajasthan. These are two tribal communities in South Rajasthan. The goddess Bhavani, which is one of the names of Durga and thing, goddess Bhavani preparing for her wedding receives the news that the bridegroom was a buffalo. She and her accomplice goddesses kill the bridegroom and feast on him. One goddess remarks, O oh sister, you have a strange custom of hanging the blood dripping intestine of the bridegroom on a banyan tree. This I have to have recorded uh, uh, many years ago in 1972 or 17 in Rajasthan. Uh, so we are looking at different versions. Now we are coming to this, uh, this iconography, which, as I said, is very difficult to uh, explain. Now, uh, as, uh, as these examples show, that in the regional versions across India, the buffalo stands in relation to the goddess as her consort, husband, or in Devi Mahat, uh, 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 husband uh, of Devi, Mah uh, Devi Mahatmya. If the raw material of this buffalo story, then it, uh, 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 sorry, 
uh, absent Devi Mahatmya, if the raw material of this Sanskritic version came from the pan-Indian goddess version was Hinduized to accommodate the archetypal Hindu Devi Asura conflict. So the local versions were converted into Sanskrit and was idealized. These religious prehistories of different areas, and this applies to many other motifs of, uh, you take any, any iconographies, you will find it. Uh, if you explore at village level and uh, at, uh, at textual level. The religious prehistories of different areas seem to provide some links to this thus far inexplicable tantric depiction of Kali trampling upon uh, uh, the body of her consort Shiva. D.D. Kosambi, based on his field work in Maharashtra, has made some path-breaking observations regarding the motif of the goddess trampling upon the body of her consort Shiva, which are as follows. Now, uh, Kosambi worked in Maharashtrian villages, and uh, he says, pastoral gauli migrants, so pe they were migrants, they were pastoral people, who came, uh, 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 when they came into some of the areas of the region of earlier food gatherers. So, you know, more, uh, inverted commas, primitive form is food gathering, hunting and food gathering. So there were semi-tribal pockets in which there were hunters and food gatherers. But the Gaulis were pastoral. When they migrated, and these migrations are all over India all the time. So when the Gaulis came in this area, uh, they found pastoral Gauli migrants, when they came to the area of the region of Britain, the two groups soon fused, the Gaulis and the, the, the food gatherers. And their deities were accordingly married. So the buffalo and, uh, was the uh, deity, and the goddess, local goddess of the food gatherer, they were married. And local shrines, which Kosambi has studied, you can see amount of interesting material is brought about. So the two groups soon fused, and their deities were accordingly married. An earlier form of Masoba, buffalo god of the Gaulis, had no consort. Uh, poor fellow, and was in conflict with the mother goddess of the food gatherers. So there were conflict because two groups anyway would have conflict, buffalo or no buffalo, uh, because there are, are uh, more powerful groups coming. So uh, food gatherers. Sometimes one can find the go now Kosambi says sometimes one can find the goddess crushing the buffalo masoba in some rude shrine because group conflict. Uh, between the migrants and the original inhabitants. Some root shrine, while 400 meters away, not kilometers, 400 meters away, she is married to the same Masoba. So, you know, there is a... Um, the Brahmanical reflection of this is Parvati as consort of Shiva, but crushing uh, Mahisa Sura, and on occasion, occasion, she reverts to type by trampling upon Shiva as well. This is what Kosambi is said. And it's quite interesting here in a folk narrative scroll that the Kali, the goddess, is killing the buffalo and uh, Mahisa Sura. But what issues forth from the body of the buffalo is Shiva. <coughs> Uh, you know, so this is Shiva's head. So uh, she kills buffalo, but what issues is her consort, Shiva. So this kind, this kind of material, if we, uh, and then of course it also explains partly uh, this iconography. So I suppose that large, I mean largely, Indian studies have yet not even woken up to what kind of things are there. We just do artistry, we do chronology, whether this is a Gupta sculpture, and uh, in later Gupta, and medieval, and early medieval, buffalo is shown like this, or buffalo is shown like that, or the stylistically, uh, where, whether it is uh, uh, you know better or not. And this kind of art history we have been practicing for years and years. But I feel that there are other possibilities. Now, According to a 14th century Jain story, uh, this is a scriptural variant, where Jains uh, have scriptures. Uh, the, uh, the scripture is called Ambika Devi Kalpa. It's a Jain scripture. And uh, according to a 14th century Jain scripture, the goddess Ambika, uh, the latter was discarded by her husband, Brahmin husband, for her di uh, disagreeable conduct. So this is a Jain story, very similar to what I read out earlier uh, 
from Whitehead. Realizing his mistake, he ran to call her back. But she, thinking that he was coming to kill her, jumped into a well and died. Later, she was born as a yakshi and her husband as a lion to become her vehicle. Because in Jane's story, there's no question of killing uh, the husband. So, you know, but the motif is very similar, that here it becomes lion instead of buffalo, but it is the husband. You know, so if you compare it with the Hindu version, you realize again that certain ideological uh, things are involved. And Ambika, this is, uh, uh, I think, in uh, Elora <coughs> century. And Ambika meaning the goddess of mangoes. Uh, and here uh, you can see here a bunch of mangoes. She's sitting under a mango tree and things. And there is this uh, lion vehicle of Ambika. Ambika is also an important Jain goddess. The story is similar to that recorded by Whitehead in 1921 and therefore appears to be a common mythological stereotype. But Ambika's story, having been a part of Jain mythology, the husband could not have been beheaded uh, on account of religion's strong emphasis on non-violence. It is interesting how common archetypal motifs are absorbed into various belief systems and adapted to its principles, so Jain principles would adapt, but common motive prevails thing. Now you already might have got some idea that the material, the raw material is quite complex. And how is that we have not explored it, you know. Uh, so one of the messages I want to give is that there is still, we have not even begun, we have not even begun. And, and many forms of ritual, etc., already died down. Uh, all oral traditions are gone. So this uh, would be uh, a kind of uh, hint towards what we can do with our materials and take it forward in terms of research. Ritual textiles and ceremony of the goddess killing the buffalo in Gujarat. Now, uh, this textile, which is in my collection, this is a photograph which I took many years ago, uh, in which the, uh, you see that this kind of pieces are used to create, to create an enclosure in which the goddess is invoked and buffalo sacrifice takes place. We shall now turn to a specific textile from Gujarat which, which involve depictions of the goddess and the buffalo, various stories and whole ritual of killing the bridegroom by the murderous bride. Among the Bhangi, Dead, Ravalia, Vagri, you know, these have become <laughs> abusive words, but even today, the, the, the community itself identifies by, by this. So it's a community name. All these are community names. There is a custom of using a number of printed and dye painted textile pieces known as Matano Chandarvo or Matani Dhoti to create, Mata means mother goddess, uh, to create an enclosure for uh, invocation of local goddesses and offering sacrifice to them. These textiles are created by the Vagri community of Ahmedabad. These Vagris were kind of, uh, they were selling birds, uh, uh, you know, parrots in cage and things, and they were, they were poachers also, and uh, they were also selling these, uh, you know, neem tooth sticks, which was used once upon a time. So that was their main occupation. They were also uh, uh, selling utensils and taking in return some old clothes. These were all Vagris. So community of Ahmedabad and elsewhere in Gujarat by using iron rust for black dye, uh, uh, iron rust for uh, sorry, iron rust for black dye and al root solution for red dye. After uh, modern thing, the cotton cloth with harda, beda, and alum. Alum. So this was uh, this textile pieces are made and used. Uh, a couple of images I show you, uh, which are. Uh, from my earlier field work. So this uh, Vagri uh, sitting on the roadside. Now they are removed in Ahmedabad city and they are asked to go away. And they are more or less given up doing this work. But uh, using iron rust, etc. And then uh, in the river Sabarmati, they wash and dry on hot sand. So when they do that, the color comes out very well. Uh, the various images on these pieces include the depiction of the central goddess, uh, uh, goddesses, other accompanying goddesses such as Harkai. Harkai is the goddess of dog bite. Mommai, the goddess riding a camel. 
Bauchara, the goddess riding a rooster, Shikotar, the goddess riding a boat, uh, Melody riding a goat, as well as scenes of buffalo and goat sacrifice, narrating illustra uh, illustrations from the regional myths of the goddess and, seen from, uh, uh, and scenes from Krishna legend. legend. Women of the Charan community of cattle grazers of Gujarat, Rajasthan, and uh, Sindh are considered to be living goddesses. Now it's very interesting that majority of goddesses in Sindh, uh, right up to Afghanistan, some parts of Central Asia, and of course Gujarat and Rajasthan, all these goddesses, uh, uh, the names that I mentioned, they are living goddesses of the Charan community. So Charans are uh, like, uh, like a cattle grazing community, and there, when a, a, a female child is born, the very first day they address the child as I, meaning goddess. And all the goddesses in Gujarat are Charan goddesses, and there are one after the other stories in Gujarat when the rulers or powerful people, they want to marry Charan uh, girls, and then uh, finally they kill the king. But to kill the king, they kill the buffalo, his buffalo. So king's, uh, king resides, so to say, on his essence or soul, resides in the buffalo. So first they, they, uh, uh, they kill the buffalo, they drink the blood, and after drinking blood, they get intoxicated, they go and kill the king who uh, makes advances on, on the charmed girl. These are like stories, uh, uh, you know, Westphal Hellbosch and many German scholars have published innumerable uh, of these uh, stories. Uh, so, women of the Charan community of cattle grazers of Gujarat, Rajasthan, and oh, yeah, these are done. Uh, uh, shrines and their legend all over the region speak of local rajas and chieftains falling in love with Charan women who being goddesses, virgins, kill their buffaloes and thereby their suitors, rajas and chieftains. Some of these uh, scenes are illustrated uh, on these textiles. So uh, you can uh, see the goddesses, uh, all various goddesses going towards uh, killing the king and individual iconographies and the buffalo riding goddesses. Then, <clears throat> uh, for example, goddess Avard. Now, this is a story from Sindh. And in Sindh in Pakistan, even today, Avard uh, is worshipped as an important goddess uh, by the Hindus of that uh, area. Goddess Avard, a beautiful daughter of a charan, cursed Hamir Sumra, a ruler of Sindh, with total destruction as he forcibly wanted to marry her. She left his kingdom to settle near Jaisalmer. On her way, the, uh, she encountered a giant buffalo placed there to obstruct her journey. Avard killing the buffalo, drank his blood, and was then possessed by the thought of killing Hamir, which she finally did. Uh, it is well recorded that the Charan women of North Gujarat uh, uh, meet on the Sehra day, worship a buffalo, and then kill it to drink his blood. Uh, the story once again reiterates the motive of the killing of the buffalo and thereby killing the goddess's suitor or consort. So this uh, is one more uh, example. Now there are a few illustrations of a very large textile piece about 1950s, which, which is in my collection. And uh, there is a story related to uh, story related to uh, to the images that you see here. <coughs> this story I tape recorded in 1977. And uh, <coughs> the story says that uh, Mahadev, meaning Shiva, told Parvati that let's go around the world uh, and see what is happening. So Mahadev and Parvati both sat on the Nandi vehicle, Shiva's Nandi, the bull. So Parvati was a 
billion rider, and they were uh, going around. And then they found that Parvati found uh, that on the side of a small lake, a buffalo, young, but the story says, young, lustrous buffalo was dying, half dead. Parvati told Shiva that bring the buffalo to life. You see her infatuation. So Shiva says, uh, the story says, that Shiva, knowing well Parvati's infatuation for buffalo, said no, we are not doing it. So Parvati got off uh, the bull and just stood and said, I'm not going with you. So, uh, so uh, uh, Shiva said, then Shiva opened his matted hair and took out magical weapons, particularly something called Bhasma Kankan, which is a kind of Kankan, is a bangle, and that had magical powers. So Shiva went and put the magical Kankan on the buffalo, and the buffalo stood up and became young and lustrous and very powerful. But Shiva told Parvati, uh, I'll do this uh, on a condition that you will not take the buffalo with you. So she said, okay. As they said, she said again, uh, as a pillion rider at the back, Parvati looked back and said, come on. So she told the buffalo to go along. Then they came to, uh, to a hut. Uh, that is, you can see some, uh, some kind of thing. Where Shiva said that I will take rest here. Now, Shiva's Nandi was very loyal to Shiva. So when uh, Shiva was taking, Mahadeva was taking rest, uh, the buffalo and the Nandi, they were grazing. There was a lot of green grass. But Nandi being loyal to Shiva, he would always kick the buffalo and wouldn't let uh, him eat uh, the grass. So again, buffalo became emaciated and was falling. Then Parvati told Shiva that uh, she had to do something. So she told him that put your head on my lap, I will look for lice in your head. So, uh, so as soon as Shiva's head touched Parvati's body, he fell asleep. She opened his uh, matted hair and took out the magical weapons and put on the buffalo. As soon as uh, she did this, buffalo became a, a, a huge demon. His horns piercing the sky, his uh, legs piercing the underworld, and he became a giant uh, uh, demon and came uh, and told Shiva that give Parvati in marriage to me or give me a fight. Par uh, Shiva, uh, Shiva couldn't do either because his magic was lost. So he had no, he couldn't fight. Uh, and uh, Mahishasura was a very powerful demon. So he was helpless. So he uh, sort of there, as I said, that he took out some dirt from the body and put life into it. And uh, then gave his damru to that creature, you see here. And he said to him, go and wake up Shakti and tell her, I am in trouble. So uh, this Melko, the creature, goes. But Shakti was sleeping for over thousands of years now, and white ants had made uh, you know things in her nose and things. So whatever he uh, did, loud Damru, she was Damru, way powerful. Shakti didn't wake up. But finally, he said that wake up because there is a prospect for you to get uh, a buffalo to eat. As this happened. Uh, uh, Shakti's mouth water, that's what they say in the main. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, then Shakti called all the goddesses and things, and then they, uh, so uh, uh, you know, here the buffalo, for example, uh, comes to marry the goddess. Here the same, but color of the buffalo is different. Here, then they finally kill the buffalo and drink uh, the blood. This is then ritually enacted in that, in that uh, enclosure which is made, uh, 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 in, which I showed you earlier. So majority of popular story of Parvati's infatuation for uh, a heap of fellow and eventual killing of the bridegroom 
is illustrated on several textiles. Um, the event of the goddess descending into the body of the mediums, their priests and position takes place where the latter finally uh, kill a sacrificial buffalo at the ritual site and drink his blood as per their myth and ritual. So uh, we are proceeding on a line to show that there are other versions and other beliefs which are living and uh, uh, very strong. In between, I want to make this observation. Material of this nature, which with regard to regional beliefs and practices scattered all over India, uh, is scattered all over India. What I said today is nearly a drop in the ocean. There is need to collect such material through field work and undertake analysis of regional religious beliefs and practices uh, and the nature of their historical uh, and prevailing relationship with Brahmanism and Hinduism. And this would bring about uh, what is the political environment today in the country. Uh, I think this kind of material would be very important. Now, I, the ritual that I documented uh, uh, <clears throat> many years ago, uh, here as you see the enclosure over here, there is a red textile put here, meaning there is a, uh, the red would mean there would be blood sacrifice. Next to it, if it's another such shrine, white textile is put, that would mean the brother or the cousin has already become bhagatized, meaning would not do blood sacrifice. Then uh, these men get dressed up as goddesses and uh, they, uh, uh, so they are the goddesses. They sort of deal with the buffalo which is sacrificed and people get in a trance and possessed. Some of them pull these pieces and cover themselves. The event of the goddess uh, descending into the body of the mediums, their priests, in a ceremony of invocation and possession takes place, sacrificial uh, where the latter finally kills the sacrificial buffalo at the ritual site and drink the blood as per their myths and rituals. Now uh, you can see uh, that uh, the buffalo is decked up as bridegroom, as I showed you in the textile itself. Uh, and then uh, it brought, they told me not to take pictures. So I could use flash, but therefore the pictures are a bit dark. And what is interesting is that right in the beginning, I showed you a sculptural depiction where the goddess is killing the buffalo with a trident. That iconography is identically enacted here, for example, because he is the goddess, because the goddess is in his body. And, you know, killing the buffalo with a trident. So it's all very amazing. And nobody can say that, well, they've seen the sculpture and now they're trying to do this. It's not true. So it is, it is something. So widespread material of this nature, we have never connected with the traditions of Indian sculpture and painting. <clears throat> uh, interestingly, in India, and I was traveling in Warli areas a couple of months ago in Maharashtra, I find that uh, there is this very huge Bhagatization movement. As I said, Bhagatization meaning Hinduization. This movement is going on for more than a century. But today, under the political environment, Bhagatization is becoming a very, very strong movement, converting people to not to drink alcohol, not to uh, eat meat and uh, things like that. So I was amazed, uh, this Warli area, I've been going for 20 years, 25 years, looking at Warli painting, and suddenly I find that they have on their walls Hindu god posters and things like that. So this uh, new thing has uh, started to happen, uh, and it takes very interesting forms. For example, what's happening here? They are holding a curtain between this and another shrine over here. You can a little bit a similar shrine you can see with sugar cane over there like here. And uh, there are two brothers. One of them has become bhagatized, meaning he doesn't take, uh, doesn't do, doesn't offer blood sacrifice. The other one does. And therefore, when they offer blood sacrifice here, they hold a curtain between this shrine and the brother's shrine so that they don't 
ritually pollute the other uh, shrine over here. This kind of ritual I have also seen exactly like that far away in Tamil Nadu in the INR area that they hold a curtain between blood sacrifice taking deity and uh, other one. So these people who were uh, who had become vegetarian, they are making this kind of offerings, uh, you know. So there are some kind of rotis on their rice and then they are big and they light lamps over there and these are the sacrifices they make. But just 30 years ago or 20 years ago they were also making the same kind of sacrifice. So this vegetarian food is being offered. But very interesting is and how previous cultural forms persist in a, in a culture is that this is the vegetarian, both of the, this, they belong to this group. They make a buffalo from wheat flour, a small buffalo, wheat flour. Then they cut it. Uh, uh, and after that, they take some ghee in, in, a, in a cup like this and drink the ghee and not blood. But you see how there, there's a previous form of blood sacrifice and drinking blood persists over here. And uh, uh, so these are interesting cultural things that uh, happen. So I think uh, I would stop here and you can do questions or things if you have any. And it's not only a question of this. This is particular example I have taken, the goddess and the buffalo. But take anything and you will find, uh, you will find so much to explore that what, than what we are given to understand through scriptures. Why is the buffalo giving so much Why is the buffalo? Why is the buffalo giving so much Because, you know, uh, <clears throat> and buffalo was indigenous for for very long time. Even kind of you find depictions in uh, prehistoric paintings and things, you, you find buffalo, an, an important uh, animal all over India. And uh, buffalo, uh, like regional myths everywhere, like I, particularly Kosambi, the idea and thing, the, the marriage of the goddess and the buffalo. I think all regions of India, Rajasthan, Gujarat, so buffalo was an important animal and these group fusions, because all the time there were migrations, if you look at if you, uh, or I can, I can use this if somebody wants to use that. So, um, uh, migrations are continuously happening. If you look at the history of Rajasthan, Gujarat, how many migrating groups, or in Punjab, they came from the northeast, from Baluchistan, from beyond, and they, they came into the country. The whole history of that region is filled with stories, what they call heroism, the story of heroism, you know, and cattle lifting was the main preoccupation uh, in entire Western India, like Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan, Gujarat, and thing. So I think um, it gets connected with this kind of uh, conflict of groups that come across each other. But buffalo is depicted in early painting, much before uh, the coming of Hindu. Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, uh, I think. Why not the bull? Sacrifice. Why not the bull? I mean, it's uh, difficult to say, but I think. Uh, uh, one has to do a similar study like what we did here, why not the bull? But if you go into the, uh, in the mythologies that are spread out about cow, for example, uh, in India, you will find, uh, and nowadays you're constantly just talk about beef eating and all, and what is now coming out is that very large amount of Hindu population was used to and is used to eating beef. So, you know, we were creating myths uh, about this. And there is, a, uh, there is a paper written by a German scholar about uh, how in, in Vedic uh, rituals, uh, cow and bull sacrifice was made. And after the sacrifice, uh, meat was eaten. 
So this is like uh, Alsdorf, a German scholar, has written a paper called Bull, uh, I mean Bull Sacrifice and uh, Cow Worship in India. And it quotes actually passage by passage, line by line, things like this. So these are, I think that paper was already refuted. It, this paper was published 25 years ago by a German scholar and was refuted repeatedly by uh, Indian scholars for various reasons. But I think if you go into such things, the study of the literature and all, perhaps you will find things which are not exactly like Buffalo, but maybe other stories will emerge. With us, we have uh, Sati Asras and uh, Bhai. Uh, sorry, Sati yes, Asras and Sati Asras and Bhai in okay. Maharashtra. Yeah, uh, those are seven goddesses and one god. And many times, that uh, one god is considered as Masova or Mera. But the relationship stated over there is of brother and sister. Are there any myths associated with that kind of relationship? I won't come across, but what you're saying is interesting in that sense the relationship uh, is somehow, is it husband and wife or uh, is it a consort or something, but it is quite interesting, that like in Jainism for example, it is a different twist is given to, you know, so brother and sister, still that relationship uh, is established, you know, with the buffalo. So I, I don't know the context or rituals of that uh, place, but I think if the myth is explored, uh, uh, Perhaps uh, one can find elements in that. So, I have a question back there. So, the character of uh, Kamakya, you know, the Azam and Bihar, like uh, the rituals followed there, you share some of the thoughts on that. What about the Kamakya rituals? Uh, they follow the same kind of rituals, uh, uh, because Kali is worship one of you know, Bihar. Yeah, but, but Kamakya is primarily a shrine where black magic, magic is practiced and taught. So uh, Kamakshi or Kamakya, Parvati's father conducted a sacrifice, a large sacrifice, puts her on the shoulder and goes. So as he goes, Parvati's limbs were falling in different Kamakshi, Kamakya. They, this is one of the Shakti Pithas where but it is the most known and living center for uh, tantric practices and black magic. But uh, I mean, sacrifices of course take place for the large uh, amount. Nepal, for example, on a certain day, how many hundreds of buffaloes are s sacrificed? They are, these are even thrown from the hilltop to, uh, to, to kill them. reverse but like uh, charans are also in Rajasthan partly yeah. and partly in Gujarat uh, uh, and therefore um, I think things uh, reverse but not overall say not in entire Gujarat but among charans even today it, there is a cause for celebration if a girl child is born because she's the goddess you know and these are living goddesses some of them I have seen they sit on a swing uh, a large wooden plank and people come and worship. She's a living goddess, you know. She has thing. She looks like an icon of a goddess, you know. And people come and worship. So, uh, but within that community, there is that importance. But I think that in another community elsewhere, it, it doesn't have all all Gujarat impact, uh, which never happens generally. I think, but these are rooted old customs and beliefs. Rajasthan Charans are also the same, in the same in the sense that they also have Rajasthani goddesses were once upon uh, Charan goddesses. I mentioned Bhaucharah, the cock-riding goddess, 
Now, there were three charred women called Booth, Balal, and Bhaujara. And they were crossing North Gujarat, and they were attacked by the plunderers called Kolis. And uh, <clears throat> when they were attacked, and they wanted to molest them, they uh, took a sword out and chopped their breasts, and uh, uh, didn't let these people molest. So this is, in Gujarati, is called Tragu. Tragu meaning threatening, that if you do this, I will kill myself. That uh, Tragu is a very known word, and particularly of Charan uh, folk singers, they talk about such legends in Rajasthan. So uh, I think, uh, and out of that Booth and Balal, I haven't seen many shrines, but Bhaujara has become an extremely important goddess in Gujarat uh, for certain classes of people and is all India's most central place for, for the eunuchs. Until, until about a few years ago, uh, <coughs> uh, caste stations for eunuchs and things was taking place in Bhaujara. Where is that? North Gujarat. Yeah. North Gujarat. understand you right, you are trying to say that <clears throat> if there was this goddess worship and thing, how is that we, we treat women? Uh, uh, my question is, like, you know, what was equally important to us? Like, you know, you speak in the thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to say earlier, both, both the worshipping, like, you know, uh, goddess and god was equally important. Like, I see that now when we worship only Linga and not only only who has no more followers. I've just seen two documentaries like how it is done and some of the tribal societies still do that. So uh, is it purposely or like we have done it purposely, like you know, stop to puja and just give an important to uh, main gods and Hindu puja and things like that? Or is it just uh, maybe that is just more important to us? Whatever. You know, I think uh, it's very complex uh, because you know it's not only a particular belief, it's a question of historically how things change. That's one. And secondly, I think, uh, you know, we, um, because we became a nation, India, so, you know, we have learned to talk about many things as Indian. Hmm? But India is such a vast country with such a lot of different kind of things and practices and things. I think uh, we should, one message I want to give from here, I'm not a great message giver, but what I want to say is, that, you know, because of India being a nation, then we talk about nationalist fervor, feeling and all, but it is such a multicultural society, so there can't be, <clears throat> there can't be one kind of thing all over India, because India wasn't there once. It was uh, different parts, different societies and different beliefs and things. So today when we say India does this or India does that, I think we lose sight of, uh, like, like uh, as I say, scriptural Hinduism. Hinduism is scriptural, but there is a lot of other Hinduism outside, uh, which you know from Wendy O'Flaherty's book and many other, that, <clears throat> that uh, there are societies like Charan, there are, there are other people, uh, many communities, they have different treatment of women, they look at women differently, or many other such things. So I think that it is still uh, a group or a territory related uh, thing that needs to be looked at rather than India as such, you know, because because after independence, this whole idea of nationalism, Indian pride, Indian, but there's nothing like monolithic Indian, whatever, even today. Uh, so I would think that these groups, these focuses, if you put, you find different uh, 
different uh, beliefs and practices. Sir, I have one last question. Can I? The lady behind For a society that's as patriarchal or a land that's as patriarchal as that, I find the very existence of that image very interesting. And um, if we were to use a similar kind of argument, which is, you know, draw from other widespread myths and say that the Sanskritic myth was possibly built on top of that, would it mean that at some point of time we were perhaps not this patriarchal and eventually there was a Sanskrit myth built which turned us into a patriarchal society? Yeah, but you know, as I said to her just now, patriarchal, you know, India was, all India is not patriarchal, you know, but we have somehow, we have turned it into, you know, because of Aryanization, Brahmanization, because uh, Aryans were patriarchal, and the dominance that came with patriar Aryan patriarchy, which spread all over northern India. But even in northern India, you will find pockets where within uh, northern Indian, cultural traditions, you'll find uh, differences. And then entire Northeast, now take the example of Northeast. Should we say they are not Indian? I would say if you think of Brahmanic India, then obviously they are not, not Indian in that sense. But nationally, yeah, in terms of modern state Indian, then of course, you know, similarly in Southern India and so many tribal groups, uh, you know, this amount of uh, matriarchal, uh, uh, groups living, you know. So that's what I'm trying to say that uh, I think we have generalized a lot in terms of Brahmanism, in terms of Indian nation, Indian national ideals, in terms of um, Hindutva, Hindu culture. And it's so unfortunate that all this what you see, you can't anymore see. So what losses we are making, and by making those losses, we are consolidating certain beliefs because the, the material is absent, and therefore we can't argue. And this was, I think, a very great loss that we did during the colonial period and uh, after. I know there are a lot of questions. We can catch Dr. Jen afterwards. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jen, for a very insightful lesson. Thank, thank you so much.